Okay, I'm, I'm going to go on to speaking about our speaker who, you know, th this is a great event for us because all of you have been here before and you look at our banner every time and you see that James Madison silhouette. Uh, tonight we have uh, a very distinguished author, columnist who has written a series of books on the Founding Fathers and the latest of which is about James Madison. So let me introduce our uh, speaker. Richard Brookheiser is the author most recently of eight books on revolutionary America including What Would the Founders Do? Our Questions, Their Answers, and George Washington on Leadership. He is author and host of two films by Michael Pack, Rediscovering George Washington, which aired on PBS July 4th, 2002, and Rediscovering Alexander Hamilton, which was aired on PBS in April of 2011. He was the historic, historian curator of Alexander Hamilton, the man who made Modern America a 2004 exhibition at the New York Historical Society, which I did attend. I even like those life-size, uh, the dual, uh, was that your uh, idea? No one would step between them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see, where was I? Okay, in 2008, he was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush. Mr. Brookheiser is a senior editor of National Review and a columnist for American History Magazine. He wrote his first article for National Review about anti-Vietnam War protests at his high school, which was published the day after his 15th birthday. After graduating from Yale University, he went to work full-time for National Review, and uh, he was a senior editor by the age of 23, the youngest in the magazine's history. Uh, let's see, where was I? Okay, Mr. Brookheiser wrote a column for the New York Observer for 20 years, uh, has also written articles for a variety of magazines and newspapers, including the New Yorker Magazine, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Cosmopolitan, the Atlantic Monthly, and Vanity Fair. And without further ado, Mr. Richard Brookheiser. Mike, thank you for, for setting us all up. I met Mike at the Federal Society uh, Convention in Washington in the fall, and uh, this was all his idea. Thank you all for coming out. This is a tribute to James Madison. Who knew he'd be so popular? <laughs> he should probably be the next anti mitt uh, <laughs> I'm sure he could do better than Huntsman, even though he's <laughs> But I'm here, I'm here tonight to talk about James Madison's two children. Now, by his marriage to Dolly, uh, he had a stepson uh, who was named John Payne Todd. He and Dolly got married when he was in his 40s. Uh, John Payne Todd was a small child, and he would be a cross and a burden to his mother and his stepfather uh, for all of their lives. But he's not important to history. But James Madison's own two children are very important. And I want to discuss them in the order in which they were born. The first was the Constitution. The second is politics, modern American politics as we know it today. Now, Madison, let me take the Constitution first. Madison was known as the father of the Constitution even in his lifetime. But he did not get that title because the Constitution was all his idea, or because he liked all of it. No one who signed the Constitution liked everything in it. All the 39 signers in Philadelphia in 1787 had had to give up fav favorite ideas, had had to compromise on things they didn't like, and this included Madison. But the reason he was called the father of the Constitution is that at every stage, planning, the writing, the ratifying, and the writing of the Bill of Rights. He alone was a major player. In 1786, he and Alexander Hamilton hijacked a conference on interstate commerce in Annapolis, Maryland. And they turned it into a call for a national convention to write a new constitution the following year. In May of 1787, when the Constitutional Convention assembled in Philadelphia, 
Madison was the first out-of-town delegate to show up. He was a delegate from Virginia. He attended every session of the Constitutional Convention. He spoke more often than any other delegates, except for Governor Morris and James Wilson, who were two Pennsylvanians. And he took notes on every motion and on every speech that was given. And these notes have been mined by historians ever since. After the Constitution went out to the states, he led the pro-Constitution <coughs> forces in Virginia. Now, the Constitution said it had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states in order to go into effect. But there were also must-have states. The nine states had to include certain ones, and of these, Virginia was the most important. It was the most important because it was the largest state in the Union, it then included what's now West Virginia and Kentucky. It was also the most populous state, and certainly in its own opinion, it was the most eminent state. <laughs> Madison led the fight there. He had to go head to head with Patrick Henry, who was the greatest opponent of the Constitution in Virginia, also the greatest orator in America at that time. But Madison did go head to head with him and beat him and Virginia narrowly ratified the Constitution. He was also a major player in New York, which was another must-have state. If New York had stayed out of the Union, New England would have been separated from the rest of the country. So it had to be in. So Madison joined a propaganda campaign that was organized by Alexander Hamilton. It was a series of essays that appeared in New York newspapers. The three co-authors were Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay, who was an older diplomat. Uh, these appeared uh, four times a week, sometimes five times a week, and one week six times a week. A modern op-ed piece is about 750 words long. A Federalist paper is about 2,000 words long. So this was a terrific rate of production. To make it worse, Jay got sick early on in the process, so most of the labor fell upon Hamilton and Madison. Hamilton ends up writing 51 papers, Madison writes 29, Jay writes 5, for a total of 85. And then after the Constitution is ratified, Madison leads the fight in the first Congress. He's elected uh, as a representative from, from Virginia. And he leads the fight in the first Congress to write a Bill of Rights and to send it out to the states for ratification. Now, he was not in favor of a Bill of Rights at first. Uh, in one of his letters, he calls it a paper barrier. And he says Virginia has a Declaration of Rights, the State Bill of Rights for Virginia, which he had helped write himself. But he said every time the legislature has wanted to override it, they have just gone ahead and done it. It's been a paper barrier. It has never stopped them or slowed them down. So he was initially very skeptical. But two forces convinced him to favor a Bill of Rights. One was his oldest and dearest friend, Thomas Jefferson, who was not in America when any of this was happening. He was our ambassador to France, and he was living in Paris. But he and Madison corresponded to Madison kept him up to speed, kept him on board. And every letter that Jefferson wrote Madison had the same shape. It would start off full of compliments for his younger colleague, uh, appreciating the hard, good work that he was doing. And then he would always say, the one thing you have left out is a bill of rights. In one letter he calls it something that every society deserves to have. And I think Madison, at some point, he may have been gritting his teeth in these letters. You know, here he is in Philadelphia and Richmond and New York, laboring away, and all his friend in Paris can do is hock him about the Bill of Rights. But it, 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 has an, it has an effect on him. The other influence was Baptists in the state of Virginia. And the first issue that got James Madison's attention, the first political issue, was the persecution of Baptists at the end of the colonial period in Virginia. Madison was an Episcopalian. 
uh, and that was the established church of the colony of Virginia, the Anglican church now. The Baptists were a growing sect in late 18th century Virginia, and they were treated pretty badly. Uh, we have an account of one Baptist minister who was imprisoned in Culpeper County Jail, which was then the next county to Orange County, Madison's County. And he said, when I tried to preach the words of my dear Redeemer through the cells of my, through the bars of my cell, uh, his jailers put a bench outside and made water in his face. This was not Barchester Towers. This was really rough, mean stuff. And it enraged James Madison. Absolutely enraged him. And he stuck up for the Baptists at the beginning of his political career, throughout his career. So they knew he was their friend, and he knew that they were his supporters. So when they saw the Constitution lacking the Bill of Rights, and especially a guarantee of free exercise of religion, they let him know their unhappiness, and he took note of it. So Madison, as first congressman, decides to uh, push the House to do a Bill of Rights, and then the House's action prompts the Senate and so in the fall of 1789, 12 amendments go out to the country. The, the original First Amendment uh, had to do uh, with the size of congressional districts, and it just fell by the wayside. The original Second Amendment had to do with congressional pay, and uh, that was not ratified until 1992. <laughs> so the original amendments, 3 through 12, became the First Amendments 1 through 10. And the similarity of that with another set of ten laws made Madison a secular Moses. <laughs> so, by, say, November 1789, if Madison had been thrown from his horse and killed, his role as father of the Constitution would be virtually complete. He finished almost everything important <coughs> that he did. But he had a second child coming. And this child begins to be born in 1791, almost midway through the first Washington administration. Now, uh, you have to consider the setup, the personnel of the first Washington administration. George Washington is president. Madison has been his advisor, almost his personal trainer during the mid-1780s, run-up to the Constitutional Convention. Madison spent so much time in Mount Vernon, people sent letters there. Uh, that's, where, that's where he'll be. That's where they get in touch with him. The Secretary of State is Jefferson, Madison's dearest friend. The new Treasury Secretary is Alexander Hamilton, his colleague and co-author on the Federalist <coughs> Papers. And James Madison is known as the leading man in the House of Representatives. He's not the speaker, but everybody acknowledges that he's the smartest, most competent legislator in the House. So this is the political dream team of the beginning of the new republic under the new constitution. But they fall apart. And the first cause of discord is Alexander Hamilton and his financial program. Now, how could Hamilton and Madison have worked so closely together on the Federalist Papers and not seen this coming. That's one of the mysteries. I think it may be people just get so focused on the task at hand, they don't pay attention to other issues that are under the surface or still under the surface. But uh, Hamilton was a former merchant's clerk from the West Indies. That had shaped his life. He worked for businessmen all his young life. He thought they were good. They had given him his chance in the world when he was poor and obscure. And he thought he was laying the foundations for American prosperity. Madison, also Thomas Jefferson, are Virginia planters. Uh, they see the world of, of banking and transatlantic finance as being a very alien thing. They're very suspicious of it. And they don't like Hamilton's plans and projects. Now, I'm not going to adjudicate between these two on the issue of substance. What's important to me here is what Madison did about it. And the first thing he does in the summer of 1791 is he takes a vacation. 
Now the capital of the United States has now moved from New York to Philadelphia. So Madison goes uh, to New York, uh, where he's joined by his friend Jefferson, and the two of them travel up the Hudson River. They go to Lake George, <coughs> to Lake Champlain, then they cut over to New England and go south, cross Long Island Sound, come back through Long Island to New York, spend a few more days there, and then they go home. And while they're traveling, they they shoot squirrels, uh, they study plants and animals. Uh, Jefferson writes a letter to his daughter Polly on a piece of birch bark from a canoe. Uh, they're relaxing in the beauties of nature. But it was surprising to me, as I wrote my book, how many biographers of Madison and Jefferson, even today, buy this cover story. Uh, the other view of what they were up to comes to us from a New York lawyer named Robert Troop. He was an old friend of Hamilton's, also of Aaron Burr. And he writes Hamilton a letter. Hamilton is still in Philadelphia working at the Treasury Department. And he says there is every sign of a passionate courtship between Madison, Jefferson, and local <coughs> New York politicians who had their own quarrels with Alexander Hamilton. So what is going on? The two Virginians know that if they want to stop Hamilton or slow him down, they can't do it just from Virginia. They have to have allies in other states and other parts of the country. And this trip to upstate New York and New England is reaching out to find those allies. Establish, in fact, a political party. Now, as you know, political parties are mentioned nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, you can assemble quotations from all the founders expressing disdain for political parties and partisanship. Uh, George Washington would warn against it in his farewell address. Uh, Jefferson said if he had to go to heaven with the aid of a party, he'd rather not go there. <laughs> the list is very long, but this is the first step to forming a party. And Madison is the first of the founders to break out of that cocoon of nonpartisanship and to see that parties might have a use and might have a function under the new constitutional system. The second thing he does is he invents partisan media. And he does this by founding, helping to found a newspaper in Philadelphia. It will be called the National Gazette. And Madison finds the first editor. This is an old chum of his from college, a man named Philip Furneaux. And uh, since graduating from Princeton, poor Furneaux's life hadn't been doing so well. He'd worked as a teacher, uh, he'd been a privateer, he'd been a ship's captain, he wrote poetry and journalism. He was going down in the world. So Madison comes to him with a new assignment, which is that he is to be the editor of a newspaper which should attack Alexander Hamilton and his policies. He introduces Furneaux to Jefferson, who gives him a no-show job at the State Department. He guarantees him a salary, gives him access to foreign documents and government documents. But he assures Furneaux that he will have enough free time to do anything uh, a gentleman might wish to do. Well, what Madison and Jefferson wish him to do is to edit the National Gazette. Madison sells copies of it in Virginia to friends of his. He promises that it will be a source of entertainment and edification. And the first issue appears on Halloween 1791. And very quickly, it begins thwacking Alexander Hamilton, and soon after that, President Washington himself. And Washington doesn't like it. Uh, we have Jefferson's account of one cabinet meeting where Washington speaks of that rascal for now. So it very soon got under uh, Washington's skin. Then a third thing that Madison does, maybe the most important thing, and it's a very Madisonian thing, which is he thinks about what he's doing. He can't just do it. He always has to understand what he's doing and explain what's going on and why. And he writes a series of essays for Freneau's National Gazette in the fall of 1791, going over to the spring of 92. And a lot of these essays 
I don't think they're very good. A lot of them are sort of bumper stickers. They, they lay out issues for the new party, uh, which was called the Republican Party by, by Madison. He names it in one of these essays. He calls it the Republican Party. And that's the name it will have for about 30 years when it takes the name the Democratic Party, which it still has. It's the oldest political party in the world except for the Tories in England. So Madison is, is trying out issue positions uh, for the new Republicans. And he says things like, uh, peace is good, war is bad, um, really? uh, farms are good, cities are bad, uh, ordinary people are good, rich people are bad. <laughs> and also the opulent, the opulent are bad. Now, of course, Jefferson and Madison are two rich guys, you know, but their money comes from land and from owning people, so that's all right. But the Hamilton's banker friends, I mean, their money comes from you know, selling short and buying long and all these mysterious manipulations. <laughs> That's bad. Those are bad guys. But in addition to these uh, party position essays, he writes some very thoughtful ones on public opinion. <clears throat> public opinion was a new phrase in the 1790s, a brand new phrase. It had first been used in France about 20 years earlier. Madison's one of the first people in the English language to use the phrase public opinion. It's hard to imagine it never having existed. He's one of the first people to use it. And he says that public opinion is something that should be consulted at all times. It's a loop. It goes 24-7. This is new in American politics. Uh, President Washington would have believed in popular sovereignty, popular rule, but he thought that worked at election time. The people would vote, and then the people who won these elections would do their jobs until the next election, and then the people would vote again and express their new opinion, and either they would be reelected or they'd be turned out of office and new people would come in. So, so popular rule had a, a kind of a cyclical flow to it. But Madison says no. No, it's all the time. He says there must be one empire of reason over the whole country. And that every citizen must be the, a sentinel. That's the word he uses. A sentinel over the rights of every other citizen. Now, where will they learn what to watch for. Well, they'll learn it from newspapers like the National Gazette. <laughs> but he's saying this is, this is an ongoing process, and it never rests. So this is really the, the beginning of the world that we inhabit, and that we can't imagine not existing, the world of polls and focus groups and media of all kinds, and now it's on the internet, but it begins with Madison writing in the National Gazette in 1791-1792. Now, I think there were some problems with Madison's vision, and I, I just want to talk about, about one that uh, bit him uh, when he was president. Uh, Jefferson becomes president in the election of 1800, serves for two terms. Madison succeeds him in the election of 1808. And uh, by the end of his first term, he has decided to ask Congress to declare war on Great Britain. Now, you, you have to remember that the history of the early republic takes place in the shadow of a 25-year world war between the two superpowers of the earth. Washington is first inaugurated in April 1789. The Bastille falls in July of 1789. It's the beginning of the French Revolution. And very soon the French Revolution involves other countries in Europe in wars against France. And then with the rise of Napoleon, these wars become the Napoleonic Wars. It's a world war that's longer than World War I and II put together. It's equally violent and it's as ideological as the Cold War. And this is going on all through our first presidential administrations. And uh, we are trying mostly, for the most part, to stay out of it. It's like two huge drunks brawling in a bar, and we're um, like some 12-year-old kid in a corner uh, trying, with good reason, to hang back. But by 1812, uh, Madison decides that uh, 
Britain's actions have just become unacceptable, intolerable, and he asked Congress to declare war. Now, one of the, the no, not one of the greatest general to come out of the war was Winfield Scott. Uh, this was his first war. He was a very young officer. He would go on to glory in the Mexican War and, and live as long as the beginning of the Civil War. And when Scott was an old man, he wrote memoirs. And he described the officer corps at the beginning of the War of 1812. He said it was composed of imbeciles and ignoramuses, <laughs> that the older officers from the Revolution had had given themselves over to intemperate drinking, <laughs> that the younger officers were swaggerers and decayed gentlemen and fit for nothing else. Uh, he, was not, uh, he was not very happy with his colleague. Now, the president is not responsible for the officer corps. The president isn't the hands-on picker of officers, but he does pick the service secretaries who oversee that kind of thing. So who is Madison going to war with in the summer of 1812? Well, his secretary of war was a man named William Eustace. He had been an army doctor during the Revolution. Then he was a Republican congressman. Uh, he could not administer. He was hopeless at it. He was described by one senator as sitting in his office all day looking at ads to see where he could buy 200 shoes or 100 hats. <laughs> you don't want the Secretary of War doing that. <laughs> the Secretary of the Navy was a, was a politician, another politician from South Carolina named, uh, named uh, Paul Hamilton. And uh, he was an alcoholic who quit work at noon. <laughs> so these were the two right-hand men with which James Madison was going to take on one of the two great superpowers of the earth. And the first six months of the War of 1812 were disastrous. We have victories at sea. The Navy was actually in good enough shape it could survive a, a drunken secretary of the Navy. Uh, but, but we lost Detroit uh, to an inferior force. We tried to attack Canada across the Niagara River. York State Militia said, well, we're only enlisted to defend New York. We're not going to, we can't cross the border, so that didn't work. It was just one uh, catastrophe after another. Now, to our credit and to Madison's credit, he cleans out the dead wood. He fires Eustace and Hamilton, or he accepts their resignations. Mm -hmm. It's a very Madisonian thing, not to fire someone, but to wait until they, you know, to sort of nudge them, <coughs> show them the door and hope mm -hmm. they walk out of it. But he gets rid of them, and then with his new Secretary of the Navy and new Secretary of War, he makes excellent appointments. He appoints excellent younger officers like Scott. So by, uh, in two years, by 1814, the quality of our forces has been transformed. And the benchmark for me is, is a, a battle on the Niagara frontier called Chippewa. And it had no strategic effect, but it was the only battle in which equal forces, British and American, faced each other without obstacles on a flat field. And the Americans chewed them up. Hmm. And the British general said, as the battle was beginning, he was looking at the Americans coming towards him, and he said, these are regulars by God. Hmm. In other words, it's changed. These aren't just ill-led yokels anymore. This, this is a professional <laughs> force, and, and it is to Madison's credit uh, that, that he was able to uh, bring this about. But it's to his discredit that he, that he goes to war in the state that he does. And I think that's because uh, that's one effect of his political vision. You know, he understands the political system. He's helped create a partisan system. He values parties and party loyalty. So uh, that's why he picks uh, Hamilton and Eustace for these jobs. They were good soldiers. You know, they backed him up. He had a fight in his cabinet with the Secretary of State he was trying to get rid of, and that got acrimonious, and they stood by him, not by the Secretary of State. So that's why they got these, these important, these essential jobs, and, and that's why these bunglers uh, were in these positions. So I think that, that can be legitimately uh, chalked up against, against Mr. Madison. But, at the end of the day, if we have to compare our system with alternatives, uh, I will take ours. Uh, I, I would rather have it than uh, whatever Occupy Wall Street might come up with. I would rather have it 
then the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. which follows you know, 30 years of Mubarak, and then and it's chaos and God knows what, but probably worse than Mubarak. So uh, what we have, I would say, is better. And uh, two essential features of it, the Constitution and the political system, uh, were the handiwork and the offspring of James Madison. So thank you very much, and I'll younger woman. She was 15 going on 16. Her name was uh, Kitty Floyd. She was the daughter of a New York congressman from Long Island, actually. And um, they, were, they were engaged. It was in the summer. They were engaged for a number of months. And then at the last minute, uh, Kitty threw him over for a much younger man. He was much closer to her own age. Uh, and he took it very hard. Uh, he scratched out a copy of a letter that he sent to Jefferson which is like almost a unique thing in his correspondence. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't scratch out his own letters, but this one he, he effaces, so he can't read it. And, and we have Jefferson's answer, which is you know, very wise and very consoling, what, what you want from a close friend. Uh, and Jefferson was, was sympathetic because his own wife had just died, so he was you know, uh, emotionally poised to, to, to be sympathetic to the sufferings of someone else. So, so then Madison is, is really, he's not looking until uh, he is introduced uh, to uh, Dolly, Dolly Payne Todd, uh, who was a, a youngish widow. She was from Virginia. Um, she had married uh, a man named Todd, and then he and her infant child had died in a yellow fever epidemic. Philadelphia in 1793, and only she and, and her son, who's been one and a half, John Payne Todd, survived. Uh, so then a few years after that, uh, she's introduced to, to Madison. The man who introduces them is Aaron Burr, who was doing some legal work for her. And um, they hit it right off. Uh, there's a charming letter from her to a friend saying, the great little Madison is going to call on. Uh, and what she what she gave him, uh, apart from you know the personal the personal realm, was she really completed his political personality. Uh, there were there were certain things Madison was naturally good at, uh, like working a committee or setting an agenda. Now, the reason Madison shows up in Philadelphia, the first out of town delegate, is he wants to, to write the plan for what the Virginia delegation does and make sure that that's the first plan on the floor of the convention. You know, he understands all these backroom maneuvers. He's excellent at them. Some other political things he's not naturally good at, but he teaches himself. Um, he becomes an, an okay speaker. I mean, his voice is described as both weak, Someone described it as croaking. Um, he's not Patrick Henry, but he, he's able to, to debate and defeat Henry at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He also beats James Monroe running for Congress the first time. And they have one debate uh, on the porch of a church, a Lutheran church, in their district. And it's in the and they speak outside there for a couple of hours. And Madison has to ride 12 miles home with his frostbite on his nose, which he carried the marks of all his life. But he beat Monroe, who was tall, handsome, a war vet, you know, a lot of obvious political qualities that Madison didn't have. So he, he did that. But certain things Madison just could not do. And one was to relax among strangers. If, if he were in this room, and he knew everyone here, he would be great. He was funny, he told stories, he was smart, he just lit up. One stranger in the room, 
clams right on. She's yeah. kind of like a, a modern day Rick Perry. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why that was. But uh, you know, he just clams up. But Dolly is a great extrovert. I mean, she says there's a moment where Henry Clay is greeting her and he says, Everybody loves Mrs. Madison. And she says, That's because Mrs. Madison loves everybody. It's like two Virginians blowing air kisses. <laughs> but, but they kind of meant it. They kind of meant it. Uh, Dolly Madison would rather like you than dislike you. And she was a great hostess. She loved being a hostess. She was an extrovert. So she really is the compliment to him. And the first time he runs for president, he's running against George Clinton, who then is, uh, ha has, been, um, uh, has been Jefferson's vice president for one term, former governor of New York for 21 years, uh, Clinton is a widower, and he's described as just keeping to himself in his, his rooms in Washington and not seeing anybody. And one senator says that uh, thanks to Mrs. Madison, uh, Mr. Madison is going greatly ahead of him. Now, of course, there were many other reasons why he beat George Clinton, but that, that was an element of it. And so Dolly really kind of uh, completed his political pack. Yes? Uh, Presumably, uh, when Jefferson and Madison were traveling down from New England and then to, to Long Island, they made some friends in New England among politicians. But in December of 1814, it seems like the establishment in New England viciously turned completely against him, almost unanimously. How did that change? Well, I mean, there always were some Republicans in New England. Um, uh, Jefferson carries Massachusetts uh, when he runs for president for re-election in 1804. It's kind of surprising, but he carries Massachusetts. Uh, Madison carries Vermont both times he runs for president. So there are pockets of, of potential support. Uh, another, another pocket is Baptists in Connecticut. Uh, Jefferson's famous letter to the Danbury Baptist has a political background, which is that uh, the Congregationalist clergy of Connecticut is fiercely anti-Jefferson, and the Baptists resent their established status because states are allowed to have religious establishments, and, and the Baptists are, you know, on the outs here. So it's like it's like they have a common enemy, so therefore they are friends. Uh, but um, you know, it's never enough uh, for them to uh, uh, take control throughout New England, and then also. Um, you know, the way the, the commercial policies that the Jefferson and Madison administrations tried to use to avoid war. They, they tried to use commercial warfare to avoid actually going, going to warfare. So they tried an array of commercial restrictions to try and um, change England's behavior by restricting our trade with them. I think of it as cutting off our nose to spite their face. Uh, and they have great faith in this as, as a means of foreign policy, although it never seems to work. And one of the effects it has is to, to increase resentment in, um, in merchant towns and in any town that depends on, on, on foreign, on overseas commerce or sailing. So, uh, so in, in those periods, then the resentment in New England uh, gathers and goes up. And, uh, and the politics, the whole politics of the War of 1812 is, is, is very acrid, very acrid indeed. Yes, sir. Yes, from um, Madison, the days of his creation of the Constitution, <coughs> over the next 20 years till uh, while he was president, <coughs> did he ever disagree with or take a position in opposition to Jefferson? Were, no. Was, the short answer is no. And, and I mean, is the sense if, if, is is the sense incorrect that maybe was he an act Jefferson's actor uh, with his his arm wasn't I mean from Paris Jefferson was telling him how to write the Constitution as well. But he was advising him, and he only I mean he has an effect on the Bill of Rights, but not on a, anything else. It's a more complex relationship. But even the creation that. of the Jeff Republican Party, weren't they? Jefferson was, uh, look, you've got to understand, Jefferson is eight years older than Madison. And I think Jefferson was the cool older brother Madison never had. <laughs> Madison was the oldest child in his family. And it was a very tight-knit, uh, close family. Madison is James Madison, Jr. 
Uh, his, he and his father were colonels in the militia during the Revolutionary War. And so all his life, until his father dies, <coughs> James Madison Sr. is known in Orange County as the old colonel. James <coughs> Madison Jr. is known as the young colonel. That's how everybody talks about them. Until James Madison, our James Madison, becomes Secretary of State, he's been the young colonel all his life back home. So he's from this very tight-knit family, but he never had an older brother. And then suddenly, um, if, during the war, he meets this man who, who lives not so far away, uh, who's from his same world, his same social class, but who's just unique. I, I think Madison was probably smarter than Jefferson, but Jefferson was just more brilliant. I mean, Jefferson was like a blue jay. Jefferson was always looking for glittering objects, you know, and then he'd pick new thoughts, and he'd pick them up, and he'd take them back to his nest, and hoard them. I mean, Jefferson must have been so exciting to be with, and to be around, and I think Madison just responded to that. But one, one dynamic in their relationship is that Jefferson relies on Madison for judgment. And he's often running ideas, either ideas by Madison to see if they make any sense, or political decisions. He asks Madison's judgment. And one, one of the most interesting ones is, uh, in the election of 1796, Adams and Jefferson are running against, John Adams and Jefferson are running against each other for president to succeed Washington. Uh, Adams wins, and Jefferson becomes the vice president because there's not yet a 12th Amendment which has presidential tickets. Uh, the way it works originally is, you know, various candidates run, and the man who gets the most electoral votes becomes president, the man who comes in second becomes vice president. So Adams becomes the second president, um, Jefferson becomes the second vice president. Now these guys have just fought a rather bitter campaign, but they used to be friends. They were both diplomats in Europe. Uh, during the 1780s. And Madison liked John Adams, he liked Abigail Adams, he liked the Adams kids. And they knew his own children. And they'd been very close. It was a warm relationship. But now they've been enemies. So Jefferson is feeling uh, a revival of those old, you know, feelings of warmth uh, to Adams. And he writes him a letter. And he says, the public prints, meaning newspapers, have set us uh, much in opposition to each other. I trust we have not felt this ourselves. And he says some other stuff. And then he says that your administration may be glorious and successful is my dearest wish. Then he sends this letter, unsealed, to Madison. And Madison writes him back. And he says, you don't want to send this letter. Words to that effect. And he says, uh, you've just, we've just fought a rough election. How, what are your supporters going to think if this gets out? You know, a lot of people have, you know, worked hard for you, political people, politicians, and what are they going to think if now you're complimenting uh, your, your enemy, your former foe? And he also says, Mr. Adams will certainly do things the Republican Party does not like. He will have to criticize him. So do you want to give him ahead of time a testimony? No, you don't. And then he adds a very Madisonian touch. He says, but if you want me to send the letter on, I would suggest post-dating it. So that Jefferson won't realize we've got this little uh, uh, Jefferson, uh, rather, uh, Adams never gets the letter. So, so that's an example of how their relationship works. I mean, Jefferson is... is you know, often having starbursts, and, and Madison sometimes is the guy who grounds him. It's like, you know, like saying, okay, but but here's here's the problem we have, or here's the reality. Uh, that's generally the pattern. Sometimes Madison is the one in the lead. Uh, the embargo, uh, which was uh, the most extreme trade restriction that Jefferson attempted as president, I think was Madison's idea. I think it was Madison's idea, it was his policy, he pushed for it, he'd been talking about this for years. So I think that's an example where Madison may have even led Jefferson into a policy area. But it's, it's a fascinating, their relationship is just a fascinating 
dynamic, and you can, there's no simple way to describe it. You've just got to follow them over the years and see the back and forth, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Steve Morris from the Nassau Queens County Tea Party Group. Um, January 1st, uh, we had the latest of Obama's new laws, uh, the National Security Something Act, whatever it's called, where he can, uh, the federal government can now uh, detain and arrest any U.S. citizen on a security basis uh, without trial, without charges, without anything. Uh, what do you think Madison would say if he were here to this uh, probable abuse of federal powers? Well, he, in the War of 1812, uh, allies of him did urge him to uh, pass the Sedition Act. Uh, his own attorney general, uh, and uh, Justice Story, who was a, con a Republican congressman he put on the Supreme Court. So these were not, these were not just partisan bruisers. These were like good legal minds of the Republican Party of his day. And he said, you know, uh, and their reason was that the, the Federalist press, which was anti-war, was just rabid. I mean, it was just inflamed. And there had been a riot in Baltimore involving the Federalist newspaper in which uh, two people were killed. Uh, Henry Lee was mortally injured. He was one of the rioters, one of the Federalist rioters. So this, there was a lot of rough, rough stuff. But, uh, but Madison wouldn't, wouldn't do a sedition act. Um, he, had, he had complained against uh, and fought Adams's the sedition act in the seven, late 1790s. And he was, on this issue, he was, he was consistent. So maybe that's an indication of what he might think. Yes? Yeah, I'm uh, glad you mentioned uh, the dynamic between he uh, Patrick Henry and uh, James Madison. Uh, Henry, I think, was, uh, I think, governor of Virginia at the time. And well, he had that. Well, he had. Um, and I know that he had a hand in, uh, I guess, opposing Madison to Congress to propose the Bill of Rights. Uh, could you explain more about that? Well, uh, Henry uh, Henry um, is the dominating force in the legislature, even even after he loses the fight at the Virginia Ratifying Convention in 1788. And so he is responsible for drawing up the congressional districts for the first congressional elections, which will happen in 1789. And he creates a, a a gerrymandered district for James Madison, which is stuffed with counties that oppose the Constitution, and also includes Orange County, which is Madison's county. And he also imposes a residency requirement. You have to run in where you live. Now, this is, of course, unconstitutional, but this would not be challenged for a number of years. So those are the rules Madison has to run under. So Henry really is setting himself up, setting Madison up for a fall. And then the final piece is that the man who was persuaded to run against him is James Monroe. This is, this is another interesting relationship, Madison-Monroe. Um, I said Madison was eight years younger than Jefferson, Monroe is seven years younger than Madison. So the natural progression is what ends up happening with Jefferson being president for two terms, then two terms of Madison, then two terms of Monroe. But Monroe isn't always happy to be number three. I mean, he tries to jump ahead of the queue uh, in the election of 1808. Uh, he also, back, we're now back in uh, 1789, March of 1789, uh, he's got a grudge against Madison because he thinks Madison kept him off the Virginia delegation to the Constitutional Convention. So he's, he's, a prick, he's got a prickly uh, aside, so he um, doesn't take much persuading to run in this election, and, and this is the election where Madison debates him in the snowstorm. And, Matt, and he wins it in large part because the religious minorities in this district, Baptists, Lutherans, uh, some other non-Anglican groups, uh, they see him, uh, even though his constitution doesn't yet have the Bill of Rights, they see him as a champion of religious freedom and they believe him when he says, I will make this a priority. So they rally to him and, and he wins. But uh, of course Henry is the force in the background who is ultimately uh, orchestrating this. Um, neither Madison, but Jefferson really disliked him. And Madison disliked him. Jefferson, you know, they were just opposite sorts of people. Jefferson was kind of shy, not a good speaker, uh, very orderly and precise and intellectual. Uh, Henry was, 
you know, he just he just knew he could orate, so he didn't bother to prepare often, uh, and just sort of pulled it out of his hat. And sometimes, you know, very well. But uh, they were just opposite personalities. Uh, yes. Was Madison uh, during his lifetime uh, forgiven for not uh, defending the nation's capital and allowing the White House to be burned to the ground? Well, the scapegoat for that became his Secretary of War. Now, this was the second one, after, after the, the poor man who was just reading all the ads for hats and shoes. <laughs> he picked a man named John Armstrong, who was kind of a mixed bag. Armstrong had been a veteran in the Revolution. Uh, he was an organized guy. He was a forceful personality. And he and Madison really did work together and, and decide on a new strategy. and promoted good junior officers. But Armstrong was also kind of a loose cannon. He was ambitious. Uh, he did things on his own without telling Madison. Madison would read about them in the papers. You know, he had to write his Secretary of War and say, well, look, you know, I just learned about it. You know, such and such. And this is not the way to do it. Uh, also, there's a very interesting dynamic throughout the whole early history of the Republican Party. It begins with that trip to New England and New York. And it's, it's really a two-state alliance of Virginia and New York. Uh, Jefferson's first vice president is Aaron Burr. His second vice president is George Clinton, two New Yorkers. Uh, George Clinton becomes Madison's first vice president uh, for his first term. Armstrong is another New Yorker. Born in Pennsylvania, but he married a living sense. So he's in New York politics. So the means of the great Virginians is to always use New Yorkers and then to kill them. Just the right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got you got to work with them. And then when they get too uppity, you just got to you know shove them aside. And, you know, reading how Jefferson does that to Burr is a, is a is a very interesting uh, example. Um, Burr notices that um, a new newspaper has started up in New York City, which is his home base. It's called The American Citizen. And the editor is a man with a great name, James Cheatham. <laughs> <laughs> well, The American Citizen is a Republican Party newspaper that's just attacking Aaron Burr. You know, that's all it does. And it also has State Department ads, which is a great source of revenue. <laughs> so Vice President Burr goes to the White House and discuss this with the President. And Jefferson says, oh, I have nothing, I have nothing, I don't pay any attention. He says, I have nothing to do with it. All those decisions are made by the Secretary Super PAC in the <laughs> So, in other words, all these decisions are being made by my right-hand man, my best friend. I have nothing to do with it. So then Burr concludes, well, I'm probably not going to be picked for vice president you know, in the next election. And he was right about that. But, but there, and there are other instances of how they use New Yorkers and then just sort of deafly get them out of there. And the first New Yorker to to break that pattern after they're all gone is Martin Van Buren. I mean, he's the first one wildly enough to have <laughs> Yes? You said, as clarification, you said both Madison and Jefferson are brilliant. Would it be better to characterize as Madison is more intelligent and Jefferson is more politically savvy? No, Madison was plenty savvy. They were both savvy. Uh, I, I would say it's more maybe application versus flash. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson could just, you know, you'd be reading a letter from Jefferson and it's just going along, news, 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 and then there's an immortal sentence. I mean, it's just immortal. It's a home run. People are going to be reading this for hundreds of years. So they're both equally intelligent. One is just no. Well, it's different kinds of intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a different kind of a talent. And Jefferson is a great writer and Madison is a good writer. You know, and Mark Twain said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. So, <laughs> as far as writing goes, that's where they are. <laughs> well, well, yes. One of the things the New York delegation insisted on in the Constitution was that all congressmen and the president be natural born citizens, which meant the citizen with two American born parents, citizen parents. And uh, they couldn't get it for Congress but they insisted that they wouldn't join the union unless they got it for president. So that went in there. 
And uh, except for anyone alive at the time. That's that right, document. yes, because obviously there were no Americans prior to 1776. Mm -hmm. um, they were all colonists. Uh, so so that is, that's one of the things that they, they put in there, the New York delegation. And I think the New York delegation still has a, a right to secede if, they, if that's not honored. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't push that too hard. Give <laughs> Cuomo a call. Uh, well, the, the Republican Party um, became the party of immigrants hmm. very early. Uh, part of that was the Alien Act, which was one of the acts of the Adams administration. And, and that's probably why Monroe, uh, uh, why um, uh, Madison wouldn't do an Alien Sedition Act because Adams recognized that as the thing that cost him the well, election. Well, he wouldn't do a Sedition Act. Uh, the, the proposal in the War of 1812 was to do a Sedition, sedition Act. Act. No one was talking about right, right. Alien Act. Well, in fact, part of the Alien Act is still in effect today. But the, the, the Republican Party, there was already Irish immigration into this country. And French. Those Not, damn French. There were, there were some French. <laughs> 25,000 in Philadelphia. <laughs> but uh, one, one of the reasons Jefferson gets elected is because he carries New York, and one of the reasons he carries New York is that Aaron Burr manages the campaign in New York City, and, and he's just brilliant at it. And one thing he does is he hires German-speaking orators for German neighborhoods. And this struck everybody's like a black art. You know, no one had figured this out. <laughs> and, you know, Burr was also uh, very creative in certain, certain ways. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. I listen to you on the radio. Oh, the right. You make dead neurons come back to life. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and there's very few like you left. Uh, it's very generous of you to come out here today. Because I've never seen such a crowd of <laughs> people, and everyone here is because you're here. That's why they're here. So why were you late? I'm <laughs> <laughs> a chaplain in the American Legion. Unfortunately, okay, I'm just the <laughs> uh, interesting thing, though, is this, the Committee on Style and Revision was the, the last committee. There was five members on it, and uh, it was Johnson from Connecticut, Madison from Virginia, King from Massachusetts, Morris from Pennsylvania, and Hamilton from New York. But Hamilton really should have been there because Yates and the other fellow had left, and he was like, but he was there. And they, I don't like to read, but it's important. I don't want to get it wrong. The Article 1, Section 8, just a few words here. So it begins, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. And it's a comma. When ah, it came, the but, but when it came out of that committee, it had a, it was not a comma. It came out of that committee with a semicolon. And it went right down to the 17th of September. And it was picked up by Forrest Sherman, a shoemaker from Connecticut, who was one of our delegates. And they had to pull everything back and rewrite, you know, the old quill and the pen and everything. And it was very close, and it made it, it made the general welfare clause definitely a grant of power. Now the fact is, I mean, it seems to me, and I was thinking about it driving you here tonight, how could someone as brilliant as uh, <coughs> Madison, and he was a tiny guy, he was only four foot eleven. He was, <laughs> tiny. He was a little tall. Well, five <laughs> foot eleven. Right. will tell you five six. <laughs> but he was, he was brilliant. <laughs> How could he have allowed that to go through? He had to know. Now, he was a cent. This is why I'm here to hear you on this, because he was a centralist. And it seems to me that the hand of God coming down to liberate his mind into where we are today, it's like, oh, well, 1937, we lost everything in, in <laughs> Butler and Hill, you know, Helvin versus Davis through a machine company versus Davis. I have 20 copies here, a bugle <laughs> dialogue, <laughs> the website, you can read no the general welfare laws. <laughs> but isn't it true, uh, doc, doctor, isn't it true that Jefferson liberated his mind? Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that? Well, because he changed dramatically. He was a different person after Jefferson came back. He, um, he comes to Philadelphia. One of his goals in the Constitution is to check the power of the states and state legislators. He's been serving them all. That's right. He hasn't liked them. That's right. I, I mentioned uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights and how it was ignored consistently by the Virginia legislature. Uh, more laws were written by the American state legislatures in, you know, from 
1783 to 1787 than in the whole of colonial history. They went on binges of law writing, and then they'd, they'd change the laws in subsequent sessions. A lot of these legislatures had uh, term limits of one year, as little as one year. Uh, some of them had required rotation, which which means you can't, you know, you can't succeed yourself. I meant to say the terms were only one year, but they were also term limited. So you were getting new legislators who were writing new laws. Uh, a lot of bad lawmaking got done. And at this point in Madison's life, Madison hopes that one thing the federal government will do it will be to check some of that. He wants one of the first, one, one amendment in the Bill of Rights, he wants one of them to be uh, an amendment to give the federal government the power to um, to uh, to uh, re repeal uh, violations of press, freedom of speech, and free exercise of religion by states. That's what he says. Now, Congress won't, the House won't do that, so that falls by the wayside. But that's anticipating, you know, the, the Civil War amendments and later legal decisions. I mean, it's. It's a very forward-looking. Whether you like sort of danger of the states, they were going a little bit too crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Wild. I mean, you know, the, the 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 image they often used was like the solar system. And these would be planets that would just go out of their orbits. So how do Marshall felt in their orbits. But you know, you, you if you follow Madison's career, you can see him. He will change his center of gravity, often depending upon you know what's happening. You know, who is he opposing? What's going on? What is the other guy up to? Who has to be stopped? How do you stop it? Uh, so the Madison who wants uh, to sit on the states in 1787 becomes the Madison uh, who writes the Virginia Resolves in 1798, becomes the Madison who's fighting the Hartford Convention in 1814, 1815. I mean, there's a lot... Uh, is it inconsistency? In a, in a way it is. But it's also politics. And this is a man, his job, all his life is politics. And it's a very long life. And he's got a lot of things on his plate from a lot of different directions and a lot of different people. And yes, he does, uh, he does uh, shift his weight from one foot to another. Um, the, Big the, the final thing, well, but the final thing you could say is he does see the whole system as including all these pieces. It is a complex system. It has a federal government, which has an executive, a two-house legislature, each picked in a different way, the judiciary, then 13 states, and hopefully more and more states as time goes on. Uh, with their own, you know, with their own internal systems. It is not a simple system. It's a complex system. And one of the uh, important and creative arguments he makes in Federalist 51 is that this is good. That, that each uh, uh, aspect of this system, each, each piece of it, will help to keep the others in line. And it's in Federalist 51, he says, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And that's the way we'll keep this system going. You know, you can't just, you know, uh, write it in stone perfectly. You have to rely on the ambitions of all the people in these different pieces to protect their own turf. And sometimes the threat will come from one piece, and sometimes the threat will come from another piece, but you can always rely on the other pieces to, you know, rally and defend themselves, and so the equilibrium will stay. Yes. Question? yes, okay. Last that time. exact point is kind of the argument I've made. Whenever I hear people talk about, oh, all this gridlock in Washington <laughs> and blah, 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 nothing ever gets done. And, you know, what I've always said, and I'd love to hear your opinion because you pretty much just said it, is this is the way it was designed. It was designed to pit all these forces against each other, these power centers, and basically only the most universally accepted things would ever actually become laws, and therefore interfere with our lives. And the rest of it, they'd stay the heck out. Well, I think that's right. I think Madison embraced the gridlock. You know, and he certainly was irked by it himself when he becomes president. But, but then what you have to do is try to work around it. And, and sometimes it takes a long time. I mean, he had, you know, Senate factions to deal with, people in his own party who were out to get him, and all this kind of stuff. And he, 
the, the one thing, I'll end with this. I knew Madison was smart before I wrote a word of this book. <laughs> what I learned in writing it, this guy is tough, and he never stops. I mean, if he loses, and he loses a lot, he won't just sulk. Sometimes he sulks. But he also, <laughs> always, always is thinking, okay, what do I do now? What's next? Maybe this loss isn't so bad. Maybe I can retrieve something. Or maybe I was a little wrong. Let me rethink. But he's always, what is next? How do I go on? And he keeps going. And the history of the early republic is littered with the bodies of people who got in his way. <laughs> well, I mean, that's personal. But it's also, it's also, I, I guess, a tribute to his, to his um, sense of the system and the importance of it. And, you know, you never give up. If you lose, you just come back. Keep going. Thank you very much.